All right, this is the point in the show where we do superlatives, and uh, it's wide open, it's free form, and we can basically do whatever the hell we want to do. So, Chris, you get the first crack at it this week. Oh, thy grade one, hand him the MVP. I'm stunned. I'm stunned. Give him the award now. Don't make us wait till the night before the Super Bowl. It's over. Yes, Aaron Rodgers, MVP, slam dunk, bam, boom. I mean, again, first off, it's really more about Aaron Rodgers. You know, of course, Aaron Rodgers is awesome. Yes, he's the MVP of football. Yes, he was 10 for 10 yesterday for 150 yards in the first half and three touchdowns. Yes, his first incompletion of the day was, oh, that's right, it should have been a 60-yard touchdown bomb that fell through uh, uh, Valdez Scantling's hands. Um, But the year he had, we know. I mean, 48 touchdowns, 48 to 5. It's the quietest 48 touchdown season we've ever had in the history of football. You know, but, but I think within that, too, Here's the, the, the thing to me, Mike. I mean, Green Bay, in my eyes, I don't know if you feel this way, but over the last three, four weeks, I, I've, I've, I've changed my thought on them a little bit. I don't know. There just seems to be a little bit more of a toughness to their football team. They're able to run the ball at will on people. It's no longer just like, oh, this team was playing pass defense because they were worried about Rodgers. And the defense is gritty and tough as hell, too. They make plays, and, of course, with that, so – I think differently of the Packers going to the playoffs than I did, I think, at the start of December. I think they truly are the king of the NFC, and Rodgers is the king of all players. The road to Tampa is going to go through Lambeau Field. We saw last Sunday night what that can mean in wintertime, and they, they've managed to avoid in recent weeks, and maybe they finally figured it out. Maybe once you have enough of these games where, uncharacteristically, you step into a pothole and you're left to pick up the pieces, and you've got Aaron Rodgers saying, we just didn't have energy today, I don't know why. Maybe they finally figured it out. Maybe it's not a permanent affliction that's just going to be inevitable that it pops up from time to time. Maybe they've figured out how to properly prepare to avoid that game where we're going to say, what the hell was that? So, uh, you know, we'll see. And if it happens, it's going to happen at home. They have lost in the time that Matt LaFleur has been the head coach – Two home games, I believe. Eagles, Eagles last year and Minnesota in this 2019 year. 2019 in Minnesota this year. Right. And both were games they could have won. They typically have their clunkers on the road. They're not going to be on the road until it's time to go back to Tampa. Now, they did lose in Tampa 38-10. to 10, uh, And they may cross paths with the Buccaneers again, but this time it would be at Lambeau Field. So, you know, look, I, I agree with you. Aaron Rodgers has been phenomenal. More touchdown passes than punts for the year for the Green Bay Packers. 48 touchdown passes. And... Look, Mark, Mark Murphy's a genius. Mark Murphy knows how to, 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 to engineer dysfunction into a positive. I remember his comment in 2019 when Tyler Dunn, then of Bleacher Report, had the article delving into the dysfunction between Mike McCarthy, the former head coach, and Aaron Rodgers. And Murphy's reaction to all of it was, well, if it, if it upsets some people and gets people to perform better this year, it's not a bad thing. And I really do believe at some level, as they were deciding on this move up to get a quarterback and all of the ramifications, and between Brian Gutekunst and Matt LaFleur and Mark Murphy, they're all smart enough to know that there would have been a reaction, and there was a reaction. They managed to engineer it toward a positive, that it got – Aaron Rodgers motivated in a positive way, much like when the Patriots drafted Jimmy Garoppolo in the second round in 2014. They had gone 10 years without winning a Super Bowl. They they and and there was this sense that Brady's at a crossroads. Right. They they draft Jimmy Garoppolo. It pisses him off. Sorry, London. And it helps and it works. Right. And that that's the win win. They have so they have a guy now that can be groomed. And they have Aaron Rodgers, who's salty and has channeled it in a positive way right. and has had one of his best seasons ever. No, you're right. I mean, people forget that about the Brady. You know, th- what happened there? Remember the 2013 AFC Championship game against the Broncos? The Broncos sold a- out to stop LeGarrette Blunt and the Patriots run game and left just wide open receivers all over the field that day. And I think that's when New England was like, what? what? It might be over for him. You know, either way, what they've done in Green Bay, and we were talking in the last break, right? Matt LaFleur is the most underrated 26-6 and six head coach I've ever heard in my life. Nobody talks about him. He barely gets a whisper for coach of the year. Shame on us for that. I mean, all of it. It's just amazing. And really, it's his personality and 
you know, really, I think almost some of the things I perceived as his weakness, you know, getting the job. Oh, I don't know if he has a strong enough demeanor and he's, you know, he's a little quiet. I think they've all been a po- they've all actually turned out to be positives. You know, he's not too egotistical and a narcissist or where he's got to be the, the big guy on stage all the time. And he's obviously has a great way of communicating the right way with a guy who we know, yeah, is demanding and tough to deal with the Rodgers. He expects a lot and demands a lot. So Matt LaFleur, Goody, everybody, way to go up there in Green Bay. I know we gave you a lot of crap for that draft pick. Not that this is a day to wave around a Doug Peterson poster, but I remember when he got the job in Philadelphia that the buzzwords were emotional intelligence. And it was more a, more a comment on the reality that they believed Chip Kelly had none of it. But I think Matt LaFleur, floor has it in in an abundance because you're right you don't have to be the the hard charging my way or the highway football coach to get the most out of your players LaFleur has found a way to get the most out of his players and 26 and 6 is undeniable and now they're the one seed in only his second season and they have been phenomenal and uh, I think we just expect it yeah I know I think it doesn't stand out because we expect the Packers to be good and he, he and that I, I think it just shows you how seamless his transition has been that that we're we don't even think about him as coach of the year because, yeah, we just expect this like with Bill Belichick. We just expect it. Yeah. And, and well, so, it's the well, Rogers good for, factor. Good for the it, it's the Rogers yeah. factor, too. He does that. You know, he's done, been doing that for Green Bay for a long time. We've had this conversation when I first started on the job. You know, there was a lot of years that Green Bay is a Super Bowl contender. And you're like, what? The team's not really good. It's just Rogers. But. I'm still mad at them for picking Jordan Love in the first round. That was stupid, but everything else has been really good. Way to go, Green Bay. Well, it, it would be very useful to have had the players who are contributing to the cause in, with the first round pick and with the fourth round pick they used to move up in round one. That's yeah. two players that they could potentially have who'd be at a point now where they've got 16 games of regular season experience, maybe ready to contribute in a big way in the postseason. Jordan Love will not be contributing unless – uh, something happens to Aaron Rodgers, which uh, will make it very hard for the Packers to get to where they want to be. My, my my first superlative is the Ponce de Leon should have landed in Tampa instead award because when the Spanish explorer came to Florida looking for the fountain of youth, uh, he didn't find it. Well, if he'd have gone to Tampa and picked that spot on the water where Tom Brady uh, originally resided, <laughs> something happened there. Some, I mean – and I've been in that water. It, it didn't Tom make Brady. me. It didn't save me. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've come to expect it from Tom Brady, but it, it really is amazing. This guy's now 43 years old and five months. He's got the wear and tear of a football season, and he keeps getting better and better, and he keeps looking like the guy that he was years ago, and the Buccaneers keep getting better and better. You know, I, I still think they did a poor job of not managing expectations on the way into the season because they had some rough spots, but they've ironed out the rough spots. And I'd love to see them cross paths with the Saints again because I think it would be far different yes, than 38-3 to three, or, or the loss that was dealt back in week one when they were still getting their feet wet, getting to know each other, no preseason games. They're, they're, they're humming now, and – I, look, Tom Brady's always said he's going to play till he's 45. Why stop at 45? I, I don't know when the wheels are going to come off for him, but they're not even starting to rattle. No. And he's and he's and he's 43 in five months. It truly is amazing. And this has been kind of like his religion almost over the last 10 years that he decided at some point I am going to push myself deeper into my lifespan playing football than anyone ever has, and I'm going to do it at a high level. You know, George Blanda was still playing in his mid-40s, but he was kicking. The, the, we've never seen anything like it. Don't get used to it. I don't know who else out there can make the commitment that Brady has made and, and make it work the way that he has, but it really is amazing. And uh, I, I think they're the most dangerous team right now in the NFC. I, although I agree with you, the Packers have improved. I I, I, I hear you. The I think they're right the there. Team. Yeah. They're, and they're the team that I think could give the Chiefs or the Bills. Yeah. We have to start saying or the Bills when we right. say Chiefs now. The Chiefs or the Bills are run for their money. I, 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 I agree with you there. I mean, totally. I totally. I, they're, he's on fire. I mean, we just talked about him in 2013, Tom Brady. He's better this year than he was in 2013. And that was seven or eight years ago. You know, again, he was at the benefit of a great system in New England. I'm not trying to take anything away from him. But what I'm saying is this year, 
where I find it. I mean, he's making plays, plays and throws sometimes where I go, well, you know me, Mike, I'm into like, what, what's he doing when nothing's there? And is he maximizing what's there to be had? And that's to me where Brady has taken off this year. There's just so many plays where I go, well, the only guy that's open here is a, he's got to throw a 45 yard strike. Boom strike. Oh, all right. There's nobody open. He's going to have to make a perfect throw 30 yards down the field. Boom. Perfect strike. I mean, his arm is phenomenal. I, it, what's amazing is he made that scramble to the right touchdown pass to Antonio Brown. I swear he's faster now than he was in 2013. And, yeah, they're flying, Mike. I mean, I think other than Buffalo, I mean, I, maybe Green Bay in that mix. I don't know if there's a more dangerous passing attack. And I know Kansas City, obviously, as well right now. But I don't know if there's a better down-the-field passing attack than what we've seen from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers over the last four weeks, and that's where they're going to be dangerous in this NFC playoffs. I think the bye weeks this year were critical, and the later the bye, the better, because that was your opportunity to take a break, to reset, to self-scout yourself, and come out of it stronger. The Bills did it with a relatively late bye. I think it was like week nine, week ten. But the Buccaneers had the latest bye, week yeah. 13, I think it was. Right. And they kind of limped into that. They have been unstoppable since emerging from their bye week, and it's about winning games in December. That was one of the big criticisms Bruce Arians had of Jameis Winston. He had been with quarterbacks who rose to the occasion in December, and Winston went the other way. Brady has risen to the occasion like we've seen him do it before in December. He's doing it now. It lays the foundation for January, and even though he's, he's soon going to be closer to 44 than 43, he, he is making it happen. We've never had a team play a Super Bowl in its home stadium, and this would be the weirdest year to do it, but it, it could happen. At Tampa Bay, Green Bay, the old Bay of Pigs, right. they may be the best two teams in the NFC right now. Yeah, I mean, I would say the, the way they've played yeah, down the stretch here, that would be probably my top two in the NFC, with the Saints being right there. I don't want to forget them, but I think just the, you know, the Packers in Tampa have been, been more impressive. Uh, I'm just I'm amazed with, with everything there in Tampa and Brady. They're protecting him, which is really the key, because as long as he's protected, he'll stand in there and make top notch, awesome throws. And we're seeing that week by week. All right. We haven't talked about this game. I got to give it a little love. I'm going to give the Vince Lombardi Award. All right. A Vince Lombardi Award to the Baltimore Ravens, because you've seen like the old Vince Lombardi, right? Video, right? We got a seal here and a seal here, and we're going to hit the alley, right? I, I mean, well, uh, it's yeah, that's some Barty's voice. Well, that was Those a little words, jersey. That's not him. Uh, I don't know who that is. Well, I can't do the, but I gave a little jersey attitude towards it. I tried to, okay? A little flavor there. It didn't work out. Sorry. But either way, I know that, like, the Baltimore Ravens offense just sealed off the whole damn Cincinnati Bengals defense yesterday. I mean, the whole damn game. It was unbelievable. Are you kidding me? 404 yards rushing in an NFL football game? That was remarkable. And Baltimore, just the way they're playing here, coming you know down the month of December into January, wow. I mean, it's really, it seems like the defense has got it going. They're healthy, flying around. And the offense, the run game is just unstoppable. And Lamar has just found a good balance of, yeah, okay, I'll throw when you're open. And if you're not, I'm just going to stand back here. And I'm going to dance, and then I'll make a bolt for something and run for 20 yards. And it's just everything's working in Baltimore right now. But to dominate the line of scrimmage like that in an NFL football game, and I know the Bengals' defensive line not all that good, that still is just uh, remarkable what we saw yesterday. Yeah, second team in the Super Bowl era with 400-plus rushing yards in a game. They actually were threatening the record of 426 set in 1934 by the Detroit Lions in a 40-7 to win over the Steelers and the Ravens go into the playoffs loose confident and there isn't going to be much talk although I'm going to go ahead and mention it now that they're 0 and 2 with Lamar Jackson as the starting quarterback and if they fall to 0 and 3 then it really does become a full-blown narrative this year that's not the story they have been in playoff mode for the last five weeks this is just the next game and this is their crack at the Titans. You know, they're going to get maybe a chance to go on a little bit of a revenge tour. Yeah. Teams that they've struggled against, teams that have beaten them, they're going to have a chance to maybe beat the Titans, and then maybe they get a, a shot at the Chiefs. And, and uh, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, it's compelling. 
and it's a much different vibe than last year when they were 14 and two, and uh, and and the team that you know everyone was trying to beat and the Titans did. Yeah, it, it is. It's it's a different. It, it's like last year. You know, we went into it just like it's inevitable. Oh, the Ravens are going to win the divisional game, and they're going to go to the, the AFC Championship game. This year, they've, they've had a fight for it, and I think they've showed us something, you know, fighting for it, that they're completely capable of rising to the challenge. And I think you're right. The fact that it's been playoff game after playoff game really here down the stretch, it's almost made that point about Lamar Jackson a little less edgy because you're just going, well, I mean, okay, these were all must-win games, and he played awesome and won the damn games. So, you know, it might make us not judge quite as harshly uh, this weekend, no matter what happens. I mean, we could have some serious old-school football between the Ravens and the Titans with those running attacks, and that leads to my next one. Mike, the NFL is is going that way. It's going that way. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? I I, I just think, and I talked about this on my podcast a little last week, because I just think it's a a cyclical league, right? It is at times. Okay, whatever. But either way. You got it. You got got it. it. I know. You started started to fall off the cycle. Right. And, but then you, but then you got it. I've fallen off many of cycles in my day, but <laughs> I, I think that, you know, we went to spread football, all of that, the league adjusted, you know, they did. And of course, college football has been spread football and all those type of things. And it became a speed game. And here the last year or two, we're starting to see a few teams who were starting to go, wait, these kids from college, you know, they don't know how to take on a pulling guard or a fullback leading through the way. And we're starting to see teams go bigger on offense and stop with all the short passing game and the bubble screens and all that. Because the Seattle scheme, it was an eight-man front. That kind of started to end it. You know, it took away all that stuff, all the Peyton Manning pick plays and all that. To where, So now slowly, I think you're seeing a transformation of, wait, this is the new way. You know, and play action and boots are great ways to create offenses. If these defenses want to be fast with these, you know, safety-like linebackers and these defensive tackles who are athletic but can play defense end, let's start smashing their face with 330-pound guards and tackles. And I think that's where the league is going to go here for the next few years. It'll be interesting to watch. Sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 it's fine because I th- I'm fascinated by this. I think part of it, too, is the lack of padded practices – the lack sure. of practicing of tackling to the ground. Right. Rarely are, are, are there guys tackling to the ground. It creates for a sloppier brand of defensive football, and it creates an opening in turn for running games to thrive because you're going to have missed tackles. You're going to have bad angles. You're going to have all sorts of things because you don't practice that. You know, this is the flip side of seven-on-seven seven emphasis and defensive yeah. back play and right. receivers. Right. The, 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 the – Run, run the ball is simple. That's that's the instinct that you have from the first time you're playing with your friends and somebody shows up with a ball. You run around with it. But that skill of how to properly get to the guy who is fast and big and strong and physical, that's something that needs to be practiced. And they don't practice it like they used to. All right, this this is the Eric Dickerson's Getting Nervous Award. It's something that Mike Tirico said on the digital clip that we did last night that he was texting with Jim Gray, who was texting with Eric Dickerson, who was very nervous during the Titans game that it was going to go to overtime because Dickerson feared that if it went to overtime, Derrick Henry was going to surpass 2,105 yards for the season. He came within 79. It is amazing. Derrick Henry is amazing. And, you know, they say don't pay running backs. Well, for every running back that got paid and went south, You've got Derrick Henry, you've got Alvin Kamara, you've got Dalvin Cook. They got paid, and they have provided a great return on their investment. Mike, I mean, Derrick Derek Henry, you, you know, it, it, sometimes it takes a little while to get going, but once it gets going, it's incredible. 2,027 yards, the eighth player in NFL history with 2,000 rushing yards in a season, and the Titans are the first team to have two of them. They had Chris Johnson yeah. in 2009, and now they have Derrick Henry in 2020, Chris. Yeah, really, uh- it's it's amazing what we watch him do every week it is it's just it's again one of the unstoppable forces in football for the most part and if you just give him any daylight at all you know and like you said he gets his momentum going forget it i mean he can just run by you he can make you miss he runs you over it's just it's it's amazing it really is he's he's one of the more special running backs we've ever seen in the game and it's just when you watch him run 
I don't think, you know, TV does him justice sometimes. But just because you watch him go, it doesn't look like he's moving that fast. But then you're sitting there and you're going, wait, that guy that's chasing him runs 4-4. Like, and he's running away from him. And that's where it's just amazing. Week after week, he answers the bell and he handles himself the right way. He's a lot of, he's very easy to root for. That's for sure. All right. You got any more? Yeah, I got lots more. I mean, I mean, I got lots more. All right. Um, I, I think we got to hit this. The are we sure is going to be my, are we sure? Are we sure? Are we sure about Tua? That's where I, I think I got to go with this here. You know, we didn't get to talk about it because we, we wax poetically again about the Buffalo Bills, but. Going into a 2021 offseason, Tua was a top five pick. You know, at no at no point during the year did he show to be anywhere in the same stratosphere as Joe Burrow or Justin Herbert. No point. I I, I just I, I'm just I got questions. That's all I'm saying. You know, listen, it, they were handicapped yesterday by by the fact that he was playing quarterback. They have to manage the game. There's no limited to what they can do. As soon as they fall, fell behind, we kind of were like, ah, we know it's over. He's not going to drop back and beat them with his arm and make throws like that. And listen, I don't care that they lost or that the statistics aren't that great. It's not passing the eye test. That's all it's about. It's not personal. The kid is awesome because I get a lot of crap from Miami fans on social media. It's, I, the kid is awesome. I'm just talking about football. It does not pop, and that's got to concern the Miami Dolphins a little bit going in the offseason. Yeah, and look, I, I think you're putting it mildly. I, I, I okay, continue to you. be bothered by right. th this. Uh, and, and Dolphins fans get upset, but it's a very simple proposition. They had the fifth pick. They had Tua or Justin Herbert. They could have taken either one. And the fact that they took Tua and that the Chargers took Justin Herbert with the very next pick amplifies all of it that's right and it creates a, a, a dotted line from la to miami for the next 10 years or as as long as they're both in the nfl and uh that's just the reality and when when you're you know it when when you're standing on the brink of that pick it's no different than peyton manning versus ryan leaf it's just in a different spot of the draft you've got two elite quarterbacks left and i got people who were saying yesterday that nobody knew justin herbert was going to be good he wasn't a top prospect are you kidding me yeah. do you not pay attention to what goes yeah. on of course he was of course he was a top prospect the biggest question about him was if you drag him too far away from oregon is he going to be able to function right. remember that was the that was the knock sure. And uh, they, they dragged him from Oregon down to L.A., and he's been perfectly fine. So I think they could have pulled him to Miami, and we've seen it. And, and as you say, it's the eye test. It's what does it look like? What does it feel like? And with Justin Herbert, it looks different. It feels different. It feels better, much better, and looks much better than what Tua has done. And it hurts me to say it because I think Tua is a great kid. Exactly. And I think it's a great story. Right. And I want him to do well. Right. But if, if I was a Dolphins fan right now – I would be agonizing over the fact that we got the wrong guy. Yeah. Period. Yeah. No. I mean, it, it, it's tough. Her, Herbert is is special. You know, I, I didn't expect these type of results, but as you know, last year, I mean, during the draft process, I, he was my number two quarterback, and I said, I think he has a higher ceiling than Joe Burrow. He has superstar talent, and it's been justified now. I mean, it's so justified that I want to go, hello, hello, Los Angeles Chargers. Please call Brian Dayball and start the arms race with the Kansas City Chiefs and just go that way. You know, no disrespect to Eric Bieniemy. I just want to say this. I, I wouldn't hire a coordinator from a team within my division to be a copycat of that team. You, you're not going to dethrone the king. Bring in a new idea. Let Eric Bieniemy go to the Houston Texans with Deshaun Watson. Let them light it up. But I just look at that and go, yeah, Herbert's been special, but not to change the subject. Yes, the Tua thing is concerning. Dolphins have a lot of draft picks, everything like that. Fitzpatrick getting up there in years. I just, I'll, I'll be interested to see what they do at the quarterback position this offseason. They got the third overall pick. I know. The third overall pick, thanks right. to the Houston Texans. Mm -hmm. How do you not engage? You have to evaluate all the quarterbacks anyway because you may be in a position to do a trade. We don't know how it's all going to fall together at the top of the draft. You've got to fully evaluate the quarterbacks, and in the process of evaluating the quarterbacks, you may decide, we think we got somebody better than Tua, and it may be Josh Rosen all over again. You yeah, can't rule that right, out right. at this stage of the game. You can't because there's a lot of work still to be done. We still have a lot that we need to do. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.